Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning here at Zion. A few things to note before the service begins. Obviously, Pastor Krause is not here. As part of his capacity as chairman of the district mission board, he is preaching at our sister congregation, Salem, down in Colorado Springs this morning for their 50th anniversary service. The other thing I wanted to make note of is that this is our first time celebrating the sacrament with our new sanctuary design, uh, so that brings with it new directions as well. Um, I will reiterate this before we actually partake in the Lord's Supper, but this morning, uh, you will be ushered down the center aisle, at which point those on the Ambo side can turn right and file in from the edge of the chancel steps towards the middle. There's no need to get on the steps. You'll stay on the sanctuary floor. The same way those on the font side will turn left and fill in towards the middle. There's no need to leave any room in the middle or anything. Communion will then be distributed left to right as normal. And then after you receive the blessing, you can turn towards the outer aisles, leave your communion cups in the receptacles that are on either side, then walk up the side aisles back to your seats. Thank you. Our focus for worship this morning is words, really. It's, it's just a story we're talking about here, but that story carries with it some real power. The power of God for salvation for your salvation and for my salvation and for the salvation of all who believe this message. We'll begin our worship using the gathering rite on holy baptism found on page two in your service folders. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. Surely we were sinful at birth, sinful from the time our mothers conceived us. But we were washed, we were sanctified, we were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. baptized children of God, we confess our sins. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil, and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner.
Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. At this time, we will continue with the baptism. The Gospel according to St. Mark. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms placed his hands on them, and blessed them. Luke Thomas Jackson, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Receive the sign of the cross both on your head and heart to mark you as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. The almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ has given you the new birth of water and the spirit and has forgiven all of your sins. May he strengthen you with his grace all the days of your life. Peace be with you. As parents and sponsors, it is your responsibility and privilege not only to bring this child to baptism, but to remember him in your prayers, to remind him of his baptism, and to bring him up in the true Christian faith. If you are willing to do so, answer yes, and we ask God to help us. Yes, yes and we, we ask, ask God, God to help us. Now to the congregation, my brothers and sisters in Christ, this child has been baptized into the family of believers, the Holy Christian Church. It is our privilege and responsibility to care for the children of our congregation, to remember them in our prayers, to encourage their parents in their God-given work, and to demonstrate a Christian life. If you are willing to do so, answer yes, and we ask God to help us. Let us pray. We give thanks, most merciful Father, that you have received Luke as your own child and made him a member of Christ's body, the church. Now we pray, grant to him and to all your church on earth that being dead to sin, we may live to righteousness, and being buried with Christ into his death, we may also share in his resurrection, so that with all your saints we may inherit eternal life through Christ our Lord. Amen. Go in peace. May turn to your seats. We will continue by singing the final verse of our hymn. Let us pray. Almighty God, you invite us to trust in you for our salvation. 
Deal with us not in the severity of your judgment, but by the greatness of your mercy. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. In our first lesson this morning, taken from the prophet Isaiah, we see a foretaste of the heavenly banquet that our God is providing for us. We read, On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day, they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted him, and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. We respond with the hymn verse. Our second lesson this morning, taken from the book of Romans, chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, truly the theme verse for the entirety of the book. This will also serve as the basis for our sermon this morning. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. This too is the word of the Lord. Alleluia, on this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples. Alleluia. Our gospel lesson this morning, the gospel according to St. Matthew chapter 22. Glory be to you, O Lord. Please stand out of respect for the words and works of our Lord Jesus. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened calf have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, 
and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told his, the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. The gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated for the singing of the hymn. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our sermon text for this morning was our second lesson, Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, what kind of power do words have? Do they have any at all? In a society that praises rugged individualism, that pull yourself up by your own bootstraps mentality. The first thing that came to mind might have been something like, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. But is that actually true? Do we actually believe that? Of course, we'd all like to think that we have a thick skin and aren't so easily offended. But what about that teenager on social media craving the dopamine hit of a like or a nice comment, but receiving instead only mockery or cruelty? What about the socially awkward 20-something mustering all the courage he can to ask that girl on a date and being met with one simple, 
No. Or what about that kid grinding day in and day out, staying late, putting up shots after school just for a shot at the last spot on the team hearing, you made it. We may like to think that words don't hold much sway over us, but let's face it, they do. We write essays trying to convince our dream schools to grant us admission. We make hires based on interviews, conversations we've had with the list of candidates. We vote for a president, the one person who will lead hundreds of millions based primarily on what they say the months leading up to the election. You all woke up early on a Sunday morning and came to church to hear a sermon. My words that I wrote to share with you. Yes, some words have real power. So what kind of power do these words have? Paul tells us that these words have immense power. In fact, the most powerful power there is. The power of God. And that power of God is for you. For the salvation of your soul. But how? How could this message possibly have the power of God behind it? There's really not much about this message that would suggest it has that kind of power. And really there's plenty about this message that suggests the opposite. Namely, that the one whose message it, it is was one who seemed like an average man from a less than average place who was put to death in the most shameful, humiliating way imaginable. Betrayed by one of his closest friends, hated by the leaders and chief priests of the very religion which he claimed to be the god of, willingly handed over by his own people, and not just handed over to anybody, but really to the ultimate enemy, the oppressive, racist, unfair government with which he and his people struggled with daily. That's not exactly the picture of a hero, and yet that's the one that Paul tells us carries the message of the power of God, and what about the message itself? Unless someone is born of water and the spirit, they cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. What? It is by grace you have been saved through faith and not by works, but faith without works is dead. Huh? Anyone who sins is deserving of God's punishment in hell, and yet there's nothing I can do about my own sin? Well, that's an attack on my autonomy, my pride. And not only that, but the solution to that problem is that God himself as father sent God himself as son to save you and me from the wrath of God himself. To my human reason, this message isn't making much sense. To my human reason, this message is sounding a little bit foolish, and really more than foolish, honestly, kind of offensive. Let's read some more quotes from that message. I did not come to bring peace, but the sword. If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. What people value is highly detestable to God. No one comes to the Father except through me. The unrighteous, sexually immoral, idolaters, cowardly, faithless, unrepentant, and sinful deserve to be separated from God and put under his punishment in hell. And this is a fate God says we all deserve, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And if that's not enough, Jesus himself says that not all who call him Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. 
well, that doesn't sound fair. That sounds like God isn't even giving me a chance. These quotes don't make it, this message seem like something I'm chomping at the bit to get behind. To my human reason, this message is sounding offensive. To my human reason, this message is sounding even exclusive. And this is what we are supposed to believe is the power of God. This foolish, offensive message is what's supposed to save me? How could that possibly be? Especially since, let's not forget, all we're talking about is words. It's just a simple story. A simple, foolish, offensive story that I'm not supposed to be ashamed of because Paul tells me it's the power of God. My brothers and sisters in Christ, thanks be to God because that's exactly what he tells us this morning. By these simple words, these simple, foolish, offensive words, some incredible things are done. Paul doesn't just tell us that the power of God is contained in these words, but the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. For your salvation, and for my salvation, and for the salvation of everyone who believes this unbelievable message. And Paul continues, For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. God told us the answers to all of the problems our sinful nature has with this message and all the questions that come about due to the flaws of our human reason. He revealed it in the gospel. That God himself as father would send God himself as son to save us from the wrath of God himself is not foolishness. It's the most beautiful message ever told. That severe oversimplification of the story leaves out some pretty key details. First of all, we're the ones that incurred that wrath in the first place. God didn't want all of this to be necessary. What he wanted was paradise for the humans he created and loves more than you could ever imagine. What God wanted was for all of us to still be in Eden, worshiping at the altar of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, never once thinking that we know better than he does and sinking our teeth into that forbidden fruit. What God wanted was faith so strong that it naturally acted in line with his will. And after hearing that, the relationship between faith and works it's really not so complicated anymore. It's actually quite logical in that, of course, if you believe in God as your ultimate protector, provider, comforter, savior, we never need to take things into your own hands. We naturally conform to God's will in our thoughts, words, and deeds. God didn't create the problem, we did. And since perfection, righteousness, and holiness, by definition, cannot coexist with imperfection, unrighteousness, and unholiness, well, God made the unrighteous righteous by giving us his righteousness. God the Father saw what mankind had done in Eden and couldn't stand to let us separate ourselves from him forever. Entrance into a place of perfection requires perfection from the one entering. You cannot bring your imperfection into heaven. And since God knew that, he did something about it. God paid the price for our rebellion and sin against him. Our rebellion against God demanded repayment to God. So God sent Jesus to live how we were supposed to live 
in perfect alignment with his will. Jesus came to earth and experienced every kind of temptation and never once gave in to sin. He willingly handed himself over to sinful men to be crucified and pay the price for the sin you and I committed. And then he rose again from that death and assured us that the perfection with which he lived would be shared with each one of us. That's not a message of foolishness. That's a message of love so deep the human mind can't fully comprehend it. And as for the offensiveness of this message, well, let's grant some context there as well. Any message that defines itself as absolute truth is by definition contrary to any other so-called truth. That's just the nature of the word truth. Of course, there's going to be disagreement, separation, and sometimes offense. When Adam and Eve swapped out God's robes of righteousness for an ill-fitting suit of fig leaves, they set humankind at odds with God forever. We're inclined to fight, wander, and struggle with God because of the sinful nature that's inside of us. If you're looking for a message that tells you that your sin is okay, we won't find it coming from the mouth of sinlessness. If you're looking for a message that upholds peace, getting along with each other, and a total lack of any kind of judgment, well, you won't find it coming from the source of eternal righteousness. By definition, these things cannot coexist. Righteousness is not undisturbed by lawlessness. Perfection does not see sin as acceptable. Holiness makes no allowance for unholiness. That is a basic, simple, absolute truth, and if that disturbs you, well, ask yourself if the God of true perfection, true righteousness, and true holiness is your ultimate authority. And if the answer is yes, if you're willing to admit that you're sinful, and if you're willing to submit to the one who has no sin, well, then the message becomes clear, simple, and beautiful. God made him who had no sin to be our sin for us in order that we could become his righteousness. A simple one-for-one -one swap. God takes my sin, and I receive God's holiness. That's the message, Paul says, is the power of God. That's the message, Paul says, saves us. And how? It is revealed by God himself and made ours through faith. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. We shut the door on God when we turned our backs on him. But God's faithfulness to us meant that that door would never stay shut. God's faithfulness to us, his love for us, assures us that all who have faith in him, because of that faith, will live eternally. At the beginning of this sermon, I said that you all came here on a Sunday morning to listen to my sermon, my words that I wrote to share with you. But that's not exactly true. Really, you came here because you know that they're not my words. This is not my message. They're God's words. It's God's message. And God's message isn't one you have to or even can seek out on your own. God's message isn't one you have any power to find, take, earn, or merit in any way. 
God's message is received by faith. God's faithfulness to us, his unwillingness to let us walk ourselves right into hell, is what saves us. His message to us is to just stop struggling against him and let ourselves be served by him. Everything he's done, everything is done, he's done it for us. And he's revealed that truth to us in his gospel. That's why we have no reason to be ashamed of this story. Our confidence in it, our passion for it, the love we receive from and share because of it, these are all things that our sinful nature wants us to be ashamed of. But God says we have nothing to be ashamed of because the message is our sin is gone and God's righteousness is ours. We've done nothing. We can do nothing. We have nothing to be ashamed of. Are we ashamed of sharing a story that isn't ours and isn't about anything that we've done because of what might happen when really what might happen is that a soul be plucked out of hell and brought to heaven? Are we ashamed to admit that we have an authority that is not ourselves, but is rather goodness, holiness, perfection, and love itself? This simple story, these simple words, have real power. And that power is what makes a sinner sinless. It's what makes the unrighteous righteous. It's what makes the unholy holy. That power is what gives life to an eternally dead creature. God grant that we never be ashamed of that story because it is the power of God for the salvation of all who believe. Amen. And may the peace which surpasses all understanding guard our hearts and our minds in the true faith until life everlasting. Amen. We'll continue by reading responsively the remembrance of baptism found on pages 6 and 7 in your service folders. I ask you, do you reject the devil along with all his lies and empty promises? Yes, and I ask God to help me. Do you believe in God the Father Almighty? Yes, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son? Yes, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Yes, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Will you continue steadfast in this baptismal faith and as a member of the church, be diligent in the use of the means of grace and prayer? Yes, and I ask God to help me. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given you the new birth of water and of the Spirit, has forgiven you all your sins, strengthen you with his grace to life everlasting. Amen. If you brought a physical offering with you this morning, you may leave it in the plates as you leave the sanctuary. Otherwise, we have an online giving option as well. If you are visiting with us this morning, we ask that you please take this time to fill out the connection cards that should be in the pews. We continue with the prayer of the church. Father, for giving us life and breath, talent and energy, we thank you for income and nourishment, honest work and opportunities to be useful. We look gratefully to you as our provider. 
for safety in our travels. We rejoice in the protection your angels give. For national peace, public prosperity, and moral consciousness in all citizens, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, through you we have the full rights of children of God. What love the Father has lavished on us through our relationship with you. We praise you for saving us and for giving your life as a ransom for our sin. May our spirits revive in the rest and peace of your forgiveness. Holy Spirit, through word and sacrament, restore to us the joy of your salvation. Cause the good seed of the word to produce sturdy faith and godly attitudes and behavior in each believer. We rejoice this day in the fellowship we enjoy in our congregation and our synod. Keep our parish and synodical leaders faithful to their tasks. Make them men of both courage and prayer. Preserve Christ-centered doctrine and practice in our fellowship at all times. Make each of us active in Christian service and supportive of our leaders. And hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Open our eyes to see the spiritual dangers facing those who do not yet trust you as Savior and Lord. Move us to share with them the hope of unending life we have in you. Go with us into the world and support us in all we do. To your glory, amen. Now we join in the prayer which you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. In the past he spoke to us through the prophets but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, who is the radiance of his glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, broke it, and gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
principles that the Lord lays out for the reception of the sacrament are printed for you on page 9 in your service folders. Out of love and respect for those principles, we ask that only members of Zion or another Wisconsin Synod congregation come forward to receive the sacrament. Also, just one more time, new process this morning. Uh, the ushers will direct you down the center aisle, fill in from the sides toward the center, and after you receive the blessing, turn towards the side aisles, dispose of your communion cup in the receptacles, follow the side aisles back to your seats. Come, for all things are now prepared.
We pray. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and grant you peace. Good morning. And thank you again for joining us in worship this morning at Zion. A few announcements to note. Um, again, Pastor Krause's absence. He is guest preaching at Salem for their 50th anniversary. We'd also like to thank Sophia Krause for playing during the distribution of the Lord's Supper this morning. The Everyone Outreach Seminar. The sign up for that is over, but note dates and times in your worship folder. It will be this coming Friday, October 20th, from 5.30 to 8.30 p.m., and then Saturday the 21st from 8 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. And then one last thing, last Sunday, the voters met and issued a call to Mr. Christian Monday to serve as principal. So we wish him the Lord's blessings and wisdom as he deliberates that call. Now take this time to please greet those who worshiped with you this morning. <laughs> 